All right, so this will be an overview of the basic operation of the Mark III uh, inertial electrostatic confinement fusion system that I've built. First of all, we'll uh, plug in the DC power bus. And as you can hear, the uh, four-stage diaphragm pump has started up. This is uh, pumping down the roughing lines. And at the same time, the turbo molecular pump is also going to start uh, spinning up as well. Once that gets to a um, reasonable speed, I'm going to open the solenoid uh, vacuum valve and start pumping down uh, the core to a vacuum. Right now, it's at around 12 millitor in the core. I've had this uh, pump down before, and I've done a little uh, conditioning on it. You can hear that the turbo pump is starting to spin up, so I'm going to open the solenoid vacuum valve. And I'm going to turn on the control boxes for the high voltage power supplies and the PID controller for the uh, fuel control valve, and that's that uh, piezoelectric uh, high speed valve that uh, regulates deuterium flow into uh, the reactor. So right now it's uh, stabilized at around 11 millitor, and the turbo pump is now at full speed. Uh, when it's first stabilizing, it uh, hunts around a little bit and oscillates a little above and below the uh, set point because there's no anti-wind-up system in the integrator on the PID control system. However, it damps out, typically damps out fairly rapidly. So some of the instrumentation I have with uh, me today, I have the Aludlum Model 12 a rate meter, and that's connected to a Nancy Wood G10-2A boron trifluoride tube. I'm continuing to use the boron trifluoride tube over the newer helium-3 detectors I have since the boron trifluoride tube generates a higher pulse height when it detects a neutron compared to the helium-3 tubes and also due to the tube sensitivity, moderator geometry, and neutron energy it just happens to work out uh, calibration wise that uh, 1000 counts per minute equals 1 e to the 6 neutrons per second so that's a very convenient conversion factor. I also have the SAIC Exploranium GR135 Plus radio radioisotope ID unit. This also does have a helium-3 detector tube in it. However, it does not output neutron rate or dose rate, so it's just to detect the presence of neutrons. So first I'm going to turn the ion sources on. The high voltage supplies are enabled, and it's at a stable pressure of 11 millitor. So turning on the grid high voltage bias. And so you can hear the counts from neutrons on the boron trifluoride tube. And you can also see that the GR135 plus is indicating neutrons detected. That's there. It does not give a dose rate though. And because that's a little annoying, I'm going to turn off that beeping. Okay, so now it's stabilized at, uh, it's running at 40 kV, and around 8.5 milliamps from each of the two supplies. So it's a little over uh, 17 milliamps total. That's going to vary a little bit, so I'm going to tune, increase the pressure somewhat. And as you can see from the Model 12, it's indicating around 1.4 e to the 6 neutrons per second. Also, up here, I have the thermal imager connected. So this is looking off of a 45 degree mirror down on top of the grid through a germanium viewport. So you can see some of the uh, temperature distributions on the grid and the high voltage insulator. So, getting a close up of the plasma, I'm going to bring this onto the viewport, and this viewport does have a lead glass shield for x-ray safety. And turning on, see the uh, plasma form, and you can see that the ion beams coming from the upper and lower left and right are considerably higher in density 
And this is because that's where the four ion guns are located. Those are the anode layer ion sources. And looking up at the thermal imager, you can see that when turning on and off the grid bias, you can see heating first appear on the left and right sides of the grid. And that is where those ion beams are striking the grid surface. The grid again is floor inert cooled. So there is a coolant flowing through the three ring grid assembly uh, to maintain it at a low temperature. This has a number of benefits. Uh, first and foremost, the grid won't melt if it's melt from overheating. And as the grid is kept at a low temperature, it substantially, it basically eliminates any thermionic electron emission, which would increase electron current from the grid and generate more unwanted x-rays. Any thermionic electron emission current is basically wasted power. It's not going into driving the ions that are being fused, it's just driving electrons into the shell and generating x-ray Bremsstrahlung. And third, by keeping the grid at a low temperature, you can prevent any thermal evaporation of the grid, which would then deposit on uh, insulators, viewports, etc. There used to be a um, thermocouple system to monitor cooling input, and, cooling input and output temperature, so you could determine the amount of power that is being deposited into the grid surface. That's currently removed right now for upgrades. However, once that's reinstalled, the system will be enabled to make that uh, calculation again. So, um, in the next video, I'll go over some of the basic scientific uses that this system can be used for. Right.